So, uh, we have started discussing the space reflection problem. Let me quickly... <laughs> space reflection... Space reflection is the following operation. T is not changed and X is uh, transformed to the minus X. That is, you are going through the origin to the opposite point. That's why it's called the reflection. Reflection with respect to the origin, of course. And how do we represent this? Well, this is a space-time transformation in the first place. Till now, we have been talking about the uh, space-time uh, transformations, which include two classes. One is the pure rotations involving three uh, coordinates only. One was the class of boosts, which mixes the time with the space coordinates. And they all form the proper Lorentz transformations. And the, the distinction between the proper and the improper one, one of them is this, is the sign of the determinant. The determinant should have the e value plus or minus one if you look at the invariance of the interval and if you analyze that, you see that determinant can have two possible values, plus and minus one. And the plus ones are called the proper and they are the e boosts and rotations. And mathematically, you can start with the infinitesimal ones for that class and exponentiate to get the finite transformations. For the improper class, that is, those with the determinant having the value minus one, we'll check that it really has the determinant minus one, then uh, they are finite transformations, single shot finite transformations. You cannot start from with infinitesimals and you cannot reach the finite one through an infinitesimal sequence of transformation. That's a single shot. You go to, through the origin and that's the reflection. You reverse the time. You, the, the, the second class is, of course, but that we are not going to discuss, unfortunately, today because this is the last hour. And uh, there is something which is called the time reflection or time reversal, which does the following x stays the same and the sign of the t is reversed. And this is the time translation or time reversal really, a much proper, a much proper terminology. And you can immediately check that the determinant for these transformations are minus one. Let's work this out in the matrix notation to verify that immediately. You see if we represent the coordinates x mu in the matrix notation, then there is no index, it is the matrix notation, which is a column matrix, x0, x1 to x3, then the transformation is, that is x prime equals, to, let's denote it as such in the matrix notation. P is for the parity, it's a shorthand, lambda is the corresponding transformation in the space-time, then this transformation can immediately be written as follows. I have done this last time, but let's set the stage by doing this. You read this as x, x0 prime is equal to x0, x1 prime is equal to minus x1, x2 prime. That's that transformation. So it is the matrix notation, this transformation. Well, this is the, what in the matrix notation, this is what I have called lambda p in here. If you check the determinant of the lambda p, 1 times minus 1, 3 times is minus 1, which verifies the statement that this improper class are the ones which have the determinant minus one. Well, irregardless of the nature of the transformation, whether it's proper or improper, obviously we have uh, the covariance issue. If you want the Lorentz 
If you want the Dirac equation to be covariant, that is to be the same, to have the same form in all reference, inertial reference frames, then of course the gammas should satisfy a similar relationship under this uh, lambda p and its counterpart in the spin or space. If we now denote the expression in the spin or space associated with the lambda p as such, yes? Why do you call it lambda p? It's not like metric. It's not the metric. In the matrix notation, lambda p has that matrix form. I don't know whether you remember last time if you were here. I was trying to avoid the use of g mu nu for the reason that it would violate the, the, the summation rule. I think you missed that. So uh, it, it has this form, but it's not the g mu nu, understand? Lambda p just turns out to be of that form. So I'm not writing g mu nu, notice that. If I write g mu nu, you'll, see, you'll, you'll, you'll notice that I will run into a notational difficulty immediately. I don't want to do that. But let's proceed. S is the one which corresponds to this one in the spin or space and the covariance condition for any transformation, as we have worked out, is okay. Okay, let's, let's do that. I would write S of lambda inverse, but let's do it this way. We have worked this out for the proper Lorentz transformation class in detail before, but for this case, obviously, it must have that form. When I put the P, the P indices underneath, now here comes that question. If I write the lambda p as g mu nu, I would run into a difficulty in the summation, right? Because we know that repeated indices are summed over and the thumb rule is that they have to be one, one of the repeated indices should be down and one of, the, one of them should be up. But we know that g super mu nu or g sub mu nu r is this matrix, but here, what is the matrix notation? Mu up, mu down, you see? So what I'm going to do next is, instead of writing it as g mu nu, uh, let's work out the indices. For, is, for instance, what is the gamma zero s lambda p zero nu gamma nu? I can write it as such, right? And look at the form of the lambda p when the one of the indices is zero. It's purely diagonal. The other is zero. Therefore, this is gamma zero. And what about the space part? S inverse gamma i, s, i, and nu. Then if it is i, it is j. It is purely diagonal, pure space and space. And it's the delta ij, that is, if you look at it minus delta ij, so it is minus gamma i. So I have two sets of relation which sp satisfies. If I write the first one as, in, by multiplying both sides by s, and then you have gamma zero s equals s gamma zero, or S gamma zero is equal to zero if you move it. And now let's be, to be on the safe side, put the P index, indicating that it's the parity. That is, this SP, whatever uh, that it will turn out to be eventually, it should commute with the gamma zero matrix. And if you look at it again, multiply this with the S from the left, gamma I S is equals minus S gamma I. Move it to the left, it's the anti-commutator. SP gamma I is equal to zero. Now here are the two relations satisfied by this SP, that is the transformation in the spin or space which implements the reflection operation. Okay, so how do I solve this? These two sets of equations. So you, you look for matrices in the spin or space. What are the matrices? It is the uh, gammas, 
products of gammas. We are going to work out some of the details of those products of gammas in, a, in, in this hour even. And there is the G mu nu, etc., or epsilon mu nu rho sigma. But if you work it out carefully, you see that there is only one matrix which really commutes with the gamma zero and anti-commutes with gamma i based on the Clifford algebra that we have derived. If you look everything in the context of this algebra among the gammas, you see that sp should be proportional to gamma zero. Well, I have indicated this c Perhaps I can write B purpose. C is just not the speed of light, it's a constant. So let me write it as B. So this SP should be B times, B is an arbitrary constant, gamma zero, right? Because gamma zero commutes with itself, obviously, as, as any, to any matrix commutes with itself, and it anti-commutes with the gamma i. And I invite all of you to think whether there, there would be any other kind of contribution to this apart from the gamma zero. The overall constants, it doesn't matter. It is the, the matrix uh, nature of it is important. <coughs> now, <coughs> the next thing I will uh, do is quickly determine the B because uh, obviously when there's an arbitrary constant it makes it non-unique. We want to fix the B so that it becomes a unique expression. Now let's picture this P, lambda P that is, in the Lorentz, in the four-dimensional space. You are just going through the origin, reverse, reverting or inverting whichever terminology you prefer to use, the X And then you think of, if you come back, obviously, if you repeat this twice, what I mean is the following. If you repeat it twice, let me do it in here. So in principle, you may think that lambda p square is the identity, okay? However, it is really more subtle than this because this, uh, when you go to the spinor space, the space of wave functions, the problem is more subtle. If it was bosonic, Remember, the bosons are those uh, entities which are anti whose wave functions are anti-symmetric under the interchange, right? When you interchange two objects, then the sign changes. Any two in a system, if you like. Well, you can think of interchange of two identical particles. You can, uh, in terms of the one full two pi rotation of a single object instead of taking two identical particles and interchange it, and you take one single particle and go around it, close two pi loop. Well, this is, uh, of course, uh, again, the distinction be between the fermions, there is an important distinction between the fermions and the, the and the, Bosons. Remember last time when we were constructing the rotations, for instance, this particular rotation when we worked out, we have seen that it is, it has of this form. Sigma 3 is sort of the counterpart of the little sigma 3 in the Dirac space. And this is the one which corresponds to a theta rotation in the spinor space. What is the original form of the rotation in the Lorentz space? It is e to the theta times S3, the so-called S3 that we have worked out. If you check your notes, you'll see it. But we are working in the spinor space now. 
If you remember again, last time we have worked out the following. It is I times sigma 3 I cosinus cosine theta over 2 I times sigma 3 sine theta over 2. You can work this out immediately by expanding. Exponentials are, exponential operators are defined as infinite series expansions. So when you work this out, you see that it, has, it is of that form. So if you take the theta equals 2 pi, 1, 2 pi, sine theta, well, it is 0. When it, theta is 2 pi, sine theta, is all, sine theta over 2 is always 0. But look at this one. For theta equals 2 pi, cos theta over 2 is cos pi, really, which is minus 1. So this already tells you that the rotations of the Dirac spinners, uh, one, about 1, 2 pi rotation is minus, the ident minus 1. It changes sign, right? That's consistent with Pauli's principle that you interchange two fermions, the, you change sign. So it's not the 1, 2 pi rotation, but two full 2 pi rotations leave the sign unchanged, okay? This is one of the most profound <coughs> principles of the physics. Pauli's exclusion principle, here is a mathematical proof of it. That is what we have done in the context of Dirac equation is consistent because all these basic principles are verified. So it's very gratifying that we have physical arguments and mathematical arguments complementing each other. Okay. So why this is uh, interesting in my context? Now we are talking about Dirac spinors, therefore all these properties should be kept in mind. Now when you have an inversion through origin, you can think of making a half a rotation to reach there, right? Or when you go through the origin and come back, that is lambda p squared, is equivalent to 1, 2 pi rotation. Go there and come back, 1, 2 pi rotation. But 1, 2 pi rotation, 1 full 2 pi rotation, not to confuse the 1s and 2s, is equivalent to a, a p squared, lambda p squared, going, going there and coming back. But in order to leave the sign unchanged, we have to make two full 2 pi rotations. So it is, in the context of lambda p, lambda p to the 4. Hmm? So I write it in the following manner. Lambda p squared is equivalent to 1 2 pi rotation and lambda p to the 4 go come back go come back 2 2 pi rotations and that's equivalent in this context to leaving the sign unchanged Instead of 2 pi rotations, you are doing it going through reflections, four times. Well, this is of course lambda p in the space and two, 1 2 pi rotation in the spinor space. Perhaps I should write it, make it more clear, in spinor space. Okay not to get confused. One of the operations is in the space-time, the other operation is in spinor space. I'm sure so, uh, it may cause some confusion if you don't write it explicit, though I, uh, I know it's too trivial for some of you, but it's okay. So how do I write this? If it is lambda p to the 4 or 2, 2 pi rotations, I have to write that sp to the 4 actually should be the identity. That's the operation in the spinor space, right? And it's the 4 times done in the spinor space. So what I have then, it is b to the 4 
gamma 0 to the 4 is 1. Gamma 0 square is identity. Gamma 0 to the 4 is the square of the identity. Identity. So b to the 4 is 1. b in principle could be a complex number, right? There is no guarantee why b should be a real one. If you parameterize the b as, say, rho times e to the i phi, a general complex number can be parameterized in this manner. Then what you get if you substitute this up in the b to the 4 equals 1, rho to the 4, if the 4 i phi is equal to 1. How do you decompose 1 in the complex space? n times 2 pi i, correct? n is an integer now, 0, 1, etc. So solve this equation. The magnitude of this, the 1 part, is 1. So rho is equal to 1. The magnitude of this complex number is 1. But it has a phase. 4 i phi is equal to 2 pi i, or phi is equal to n. Let's not forget the n. So phi is equal to then n times pi over 2. These phases are important. I'm talking about discrete transformations. The phases for the continuous transformations are not imp important, but these single shot discrete transformations for those transformation phases are important. That's the reason why I'm going through this. So let's check. n equals 0, 0. n equals 1, pi over 2 n equals 2 pi, n equals 3, 3 pi over 2, and n equals 4, 2 pi, which is equivalent to 0. We go back to the 0. So what are the corresponding e to the i phi's for this? If I write e to the i phi underneath, this is plus 1, this is i, this one is i, this one is minus 1, this one is minus i. So there are four phases. If I now write the b, b is equal to following plus minus 1 and plus minus i times gamma 0. And the sp is b times gamma. So this is B purely. So SP is B times gamma zero with the corresponding Bs. Plus minus one or plus minus i. Plus minus i is e to the i times plus minus e to the plus minus i pi over two. So it's an important phase. So that completes the discussion of the space reflection in the Dirac theory. As I said, we could discuss it similarly for the time reversal etc. But as I said, there is not enough time for going into those beautiful CPT theorem, which has C is the charge conjugation, P is the, the space reflection parity, T is the time reversal. And perhaps some of you have heard about it. CPT is the fundamental symmetry of the, now the well-known standard physics. It is one of the invariances. Even people nowadays questioning it. When you construct a field theory, for the micro world, quantum field theory, then you ensure that CPT is intact, it's unbroken. And if there is, in that sense, a CP violation, matter antimatter or particle antiparticle symmetry violation, that also corresponds to T violation, time reversal. It is one of the active fields of research, a very active field of research, and one of the purposes of building LHC was not only to discover this, that missing particle Higgs, also to look for the CP violation properties. And we may hear some new developments in next year, this year that is, concerning the CP, because that machine is a very powerful machine. So it is sort of an introduction to that subject at this elementary level. But unfortunately, we cannot push it very further. So I stop in here and turn my attention to something else now. Okay. 
Now the subject, the, new, the next subject I will discuss is the so-called bilinear covariance. Eventually, <coughs> bilinear covariance in the spinor space. Well, this is a very relevant for the construction of models for particle interactions. Therefore, it's a very relevant discussion. Bilinear covariance. Well, this subject, this title may not be that clear at the beginning. So let's proceed the discussion and we'll see what it means in due time. Bilinearity is, of course, those of you, the, the terminology of bilinearity is that there are some things, the sandwich between psi bar and psi, that's bilinear, twicely. There are two of them involved. And what are the things which are sandwich? We'll see. Okay. So. What are the number of linearly independent? What is the number of linearly independent four by four matrices in this space? What is the number of linearly independent? Four by four matrices in the spinor space. This is the question we start with. Why this is an irrelevant question in the first place? For instance, we have the four by four matrices in hand, right? Gamma mu, gamma nu, twice g mu nu i. These are all matrices in the spinor space. And we would like to see what are the ones which you can sort of use gammas to construct. Let's, let me go back to the two-dimensional spinor space. We are all familiar with the two-dimensional spinor space, right? Which, are, which, which is the correct dimension in the non-relativistic case. I'm sure you have seen that the number of linearly independent matrices in the two-dimensional spinor space is four. Three sigmas and one identity. So make a note of it. In two-dimensional spinor space, there are three sigmas, sigma one, sigma 2 and sigma 3 and the two-dimensional identity, these four form a linearly independent set so that any 2 by 2 matrix, any 2 by 2 matrix can be expressed as a linear superposition of these four. And is this sort of, are you sort of convinced why there should be 3 plus 1, think of the 2 by 2 unitary matrices, for instance. You can think of 3 by 3 orthogonal matrices as well, but these unitary matrices are important because you know that most of the symmetry transformations are generated by these unitary matrices, most of them. In the four-dimensional case, there is a more generalized form of the unitarity, but in the three-dimensional space, in the two-dimensional spinor space, there is no ambiguity. And what are the two by two unitary matrices? They form a group, right, in here, SU2. S is the special unitary, special unitary, that is those determinants plus one. 
That's the S stands for special. Special means determinant one. Otherwise, these are two by two unitary matrices. Two by two matrix in general, a general two by two matrix contains how many parameters? Two by two is four, and if they can be complex, two times four is eight. But altogether, when you work out the unitarity together with the special nature of the unitarity, you know that these groups have three generators. And the generate, there is an algebra which has generator. The number of generators are three. You exponentiate the algebra, you get the group. That's the standard theorem of mathematics. So, and the number of generators in principle, when this is two, two squared minus one, which is three, and if it is an arbitrary n, n squared minus one is the number of generators associated with the algebras of general S, U, N. Now here we have four by four matrices to start with. We have decided that we have four by four matrices, right, gammas? And the space is four dimensional. The column matrix, spin or column matrix has four entries. Psi one, psi two, psi three, and psi four. Any transformation of these among themselves, these four dimensional spinors are four by four matrices. And if they are symmetric transformation, they are usually unitary or generalized unitary, not naively unitary. Therefore, what are the number of generators of, if there is an algebra, it is four squared minus one. which is 16 minus 1, 5, 15. So you expect, if you really sort of carry over without proof those theorems from the theory of algebra, you expect to have 15 linearly independent matrices plus the identity altogether. 15 generators of the algebra plus the one identity to, com to form a linearly independent set. Three generators of the SU2 group plus the identity to form a linearly independent set. So it is 15 plus one, the identity. 15 generators plus one, the identity in four, they should form a linearly independent set. So this is sort of a hand waving argument, plausibility argument, it's not a proof. I'm just carrying over some information from the theory of algebra, but if you go to a mathematics class in the other department, they will give you a very sophisticated set of con constructions. So we are not going to do that. We just use those results. So I claim that those 15 are the following. Let me follow the book's notation so that we, I don't deviate from the No notation. We call those gammas. This set, this set will be denoted with the gamma n. That's the notation. And n will run from 1 to 16. One of them will be the identity. And that is labeled by the S standing for scalar 1. And there are four obviously as the four carries a vector index and goes with the V meaning vector and they are the gamma mu's, four of them. Already they are the natural candidates. And there are the so-called tensor ones which we have constructed to be those sigma mu nu's in the S operation. And there is this rather interesting exotic expression which stands, which is labeled by P. Obviously, when it's labeled by P, you think that it would be related to parity. Indeed so. So it is defined as I, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3. The name is gamma 5. Well, this is an old name. When in the old time there was the space and time was labeled as one, two, three, and four in imaginary one, when they needed a new place, they called it five. If they were using this new notation that we have been using in the last 50 years, zero, one, two, and three, they would have it, it would have been called gamma four. So it is sort of a, a hand 
a traditional notation. And finally, there is the, again, a vector-like thing, but it goes with the super label A standing for axial. So the scalar and pseudo-scalar, vector and axial vector. Let's count indeed that our plausibility argument, which I have summarized there, is consistent with, with this one. There's one in here and one in here too. Four and four, eight, and two, ten. And sigma mu nu, how many of them? Six. Let's, let's count. If one of the indices are zero, the other is the space. Well, first of all, this is anti-symmetric, therefore there is no diagonal elements. Zero is zero, zero is zero, one, one, two, two, three, three are zero. That's gone. Anti-symmetric, so six. Diagonal elements are zero, and this and that. So there are six of them all together, then 16. It's consistent. So our counting is correct. Once the counting is correct, we propose this is a sort of a guess, if you want. We have sort of guessed and constructed the 16 linearly independent one, or 15 plus 1 identity, remember? 4 means 3 plus 1. One of them is the identity to make it linearly independent. So let's verify that these, these really form a linearly independent set. In order to verify this, so what we have to, what we need to do is need to demonstrate that a n gamma n is equal to zero for n running from one to sixteen, or instead of one to sixteen, they will be labeled by the S and P's and V's, etc. but we know what we are talking about. Altogether, 16 of them. That is the theorem of linear independence, right? If this equation is valid, then it is uh, satisfied only when all the AN, all 16 AN are zero. Similarly, if we have written it as a linear superposition, of a1 sigma 1 plus a2 sigma 2 a3 sigma 3 a0 i and if this is zero as a general equation then this is can be satisfied only when all the four coefficients are zero that's the meaning of linear independence meaning linear independence For that, we need to go through and check some of the properties, some observations concerning the properties of all these 16 matrices. For n different than s, s is the scalar identity, trace of all of them is zero. This one, the n, if you look at the n, trace gamma s is what its identity, one plus one plus one, etc. four. So that is an exception. This is for n different than s. Well, I invite you just to check inspection. Let's see. Well, the, these are all known things. Perhaps the only unknown thing could be this one that we didn't work out. If you work this out, it is this beautiful matrix. There are ones in the off diagonal. And gammas are well known. What are the gammas? 
Gamma zero is the beta. Beta is one in the upper diagonal minus one in the lower diagonal. You sum the diagonal elements, you get zero. And the other one, space parts, are the sigmas and sigmas of diagonal. Diagonal elements are zero. Again, that's zero. And sigma mu nu, sigma mu nu, remember, has two sets. The zero and i components are the alpha i, and diagonal components are the, that's ij components are the capital sigma. Capital sigma have the little sigmas on the diagonal. Little sigmas are traceless, they all have traces, zero. And alpha i again, off diagonal sigma and sigma traces are zero. So if you multiply gamma phi with the gamma mu, suppose you multiply the beta with this one, what do you get? Let me check it and so that we have, we finish the inspection. What is gamma five times gamma zero? I and I, one and minus one, and this is zero, right? That one is zero, that one is minus one, one, zero. Again, off diagonal. So this trace is zero, and you can repeat the same with the gamma five times alphas. Again, you get off diagonal, and the traces are zero. So we haven't done any sophisticated proof. You could, in principle, but we don't want to do it in this class. Whenever possible, we would like to work out the explicit expressions. So this statement is verified. Is there anything that we have left out? I guess not. We have worked out everything. That all these six, 15 of them, except the identity, gamma s, we put the exception in here, all the 15 of them are traceless. Good. If it is traceless, let's proceed to take the trace of that expression. Trace of n equals 1 to 16 a n gamma n. If it is equal to 0, then trace of it is equal to 0, right? I'm trying to solve for the a's. Start with the equation being 0 and would like to discover whether indeed all the a's should be 0 to prove the linear independence. So what do I get? If it is 0 to start with, trace of it is 0, then I have all the 16 of them in here. But if I write this explicitly as a scalar gamma scalar plus n different than s, that's the sum over the 15, a n gamma n, if I expand inside as such, all these 15 are traceless. When I run the trace operation, I've got zero from the second, and I will get the, from the gamma s trace of gamma s is four, so the result of this equation is 4 AS is equal to 0, meaning AS is equal to 0. As a first step, I have proven that AS is equal to 0. Well, not that much, you may say, but not bad either, right? So the first step is done. So the equation is reduced and N different than S. So involving 15, if you want, under, if you want to make sure. So the new equation is reduced to this one. So what else I will do? The next step for this new reduced equation involving only a sum over the 15, I sum this by gamma m, multiply by gamma m different than gamma s. I choose now, I, you know, I had originally a 16. I left the gamma s out. This was originally 16. Now I deal with this gr group of 15. I throw it out. So multiply this with gamma m, which is chosen from this group again, so that it's not equal to gamma s. What do I have? Then sum n different than s, m different than s, a n gamma m, gamma n is equal to zero. Now the question is the following. Here when I'm running over the 15, 
that is, when n is equal to m in that group, there is a special term, am gamma m squared plus n different than s and n different than m. So I have moved to 14. This, this sum involves 14. S was already out, and I have also punched out the m. So I have a n times gamma n gamma m and n different than m. Claim. This product belongs to that remaining 14. This is this requires a bit of checking, right? We have to go inspection. We have to go back to here. If I leave out this, what we have to do next is demonstrate that the sum of any 15, any of the two of the 15, gives you another one in the family. Because I will come to that. But here, I don't want to include this one, because if you include this one, when you multiply anything with identity, you get the same. So it's a trivial proof. So what I need to prove now that you take any one of these two, multiply the two, then you get something belonging to the same set. OK. Is it clear? So we have to really do a bit of, uh, I, I need to do that patiently because as we, the only check, the only means that we have in this game is inspection. We have to make sure that nothing is left out and I will do that after the break, okay? There are sophisticated ways of doing it but we don't want to do it here using algebraic theorems. This is sufficient for us.